Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And welcome everyone to the Thursday edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Along with Jim Garrity of National Review, I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives today. As usual, we start with the good. And Jim was kind of odd earlier this week after months and months of Democrats in fairly red to purple states uh, basically saying, no, I'm not really that close to Obama. I don't really vote for him all that much. You got the president going on Al Sharpton's radio show, I think it was on Monday, saying these people are great allies, supporters. They always vote the way I want to. We got to reelect them. So a little bit of message conflict. Some say it's, hey, we're not getting the independence, so we got to really turn out the base. But Charles Krauthammer over at Fox News, who's also a psychologist, mind you, uh, has this approach to it. And uh, I think there might be some truth here. Look, this is a guy who six years ago had a, a worship service at a Denver stadium, uh, being cheered by people while he was behind Greek columns. A few weeks earlier, he'd been the hero of 200,000 Germans in Berlin. I still don't understand what that speech was about. He was a man, I mean, as I think Rich Lowry said earlier tonight, bestriding the world. He was a citizen of the world, the most interesting, most sought after. A rock star, a political rock star on the planet. And now he's got to hide under his desk until November. This is a total humiliation for him, and every once in a while, he can't take it, so it pops out. I, this is a way of saying, you know, I'm not, I transcend the party, I'm bigger than the party, I still am, and I'm still here. I mean, he's not going to go out and campaign in these states, obviously, but this is hard for him to take. Jim, obviously Obama's ego has never been a problem for him, but when he's basically asked to stay home in all of these key Senate races, maybe every once in a while he does want to still make folks believe he's the, the one who can get the magic done for them. There's got to be at least a small portion of Obama that is not happy with the fact that he has to uh, stay away from these. Ca- he's allowed to come in for fundraising. <laughs> um, but that he can't go out on the trail, and their people are undoubtedly are telling them, if you come out on the trail, you will hurt me. I, actually, it was you know Mark Bigich up in Alaska, is now trying to line that yes, I voted for Obama, but he's not relevant now. That you know he's going to be gone in two years, so you shouldn't really base that your your decision this year on on what you think of Obama. When Democrats have to run around insisting you're irrelevant, <laughs> that's <laughs> that's got to sting, right? I mean, you almost feel a shred of sympathy to Obama if he hadn't done such a terrible job in so many different areas. But the other thing also I just kind of note, which is a that you know every party has a balancing act between the base of the party and the folks in the middle who just don't see things the same way. These are vulnerable red state Democrats who are trying to say, look, you know, I am nothing like Obama. I'm totally a centrist. I disagree with him all the time and stuff like that. That's what they have to say to not get shredded amongst the uh, – independence and, and, you know, to, to try to mitigate some of the anger of the Republicans. I don't think that's going to do much good. But the base of the party, you know, Obama's still got, you know, his, his approval rating is down to like 40, which is bad. That still means 40. You know, there are a bunch of Democrats out there who totally buy into everything Obama's doing and still think he's doing a great job and he is their man and all that stuff. So Obama's kind of, you know, by doing the Al Sharpton show and these other, you know, venues, he's trying to say primarily to the African-Americans and other groups that are still very uh, positive on Obama. Look, they're still my guys. Don't worry. They're still good. And the problem is that in a you know modern media world, Obama says that on the Al Sharpton radio show. Everybody else is going to hear it and pick it up. And, out, you know, the Republicans will be happy to, add, you know, blast that out and say, see, every Democrat who's insisting they're independent and they disagree with Obama. And as, as Mark Udall said, I'm the last person they want to see come into the White House. I got to tell you, a number of guys jumping the fence lately. There are lots of other people that they don't want to see come into the White House. <laughs> Um, you know, the double message saying one thing to your base and another thing to the pe- to the rest of the public uh, just doesn't fly anymore. All right. On to uh, the bad martini now. And to no one's surprise, we're going to talk a little bit about what happened yesterday in Ottawa, uh, the terrorist attack at the War Memorial and then inside the Parliament building. This obviously could have been much worse. The sergeant at arms in the Parliament is being hailed as a hero today, and rightly so. The only person to die in the Parliament building was the gunman. Uh, sadly, there was a soldier killed at the War Memorial, Corporal Nathan Cirillo. We're not going to be saying the name of the uh, terrorist. He was about 32 years old and a recent convert to Islam. So, Jim, there's a number of uh, bad martinis uh, potentially to talk about here. Number one, the fact that this happened, that it happened in North America. This comes 
many believe, uh, based on recent chatter, uh, that, that ISIS is, is somehow either an inspiration or somehow connected to this. We just saw the beheading in Oklahoma, so it's another terrorist attack on North American soil. And I guess one good part is at least the Canadians are willing to call it terrorism. Yeah, I, I think you hit on a lot, a lot of the most important notes. I, I guess the two things that are jumping out here are, you know, this, this was not a, this was, they said, a recent convert to Islam, just using guns, you know, managed to bring Ottawa to a standstill yesterday. It's not a terribly big capital city. Uh, I've been there a few times. I actually had a friend who was uh, outside of her office in a coffee shop not too far from where all this was going down. She was, you know, basically holed up in the coffee shop. They basically told everybody to stay off the streets uh, for quite a few hours yesterday. She's fine. Her husband's fine. Her child's fine. Everything's okay there. But, you know, obviously a lot of people in Ottawa um, dealt with the fear of terrorism up close and personal. As far as the actions of one guy, did they ever find a second shooter, Greg? Any indication that there were other folks involved? No. Okay. So, you know, one guy um, decides to go and do this and, and, you know, in light of that, it's very easy to imagine that happening in a U.S. city. It is very easy to imagine it happening in Washington, D.C. And you have this nagging feeling that um, we hear about the reports of the people who have fought for ISIS and coming back. This guy wasn't even one of those. But how closely are we monitoring people going to ISIS and that, you know, who, who go to Syria or Iraq and come back? And then the next question is, you know, are, are these how easy is it for somebody to get radicalized and, and to decide this is what I'm supposed to do in life, it's kind of a combining our, our worst fears of Islamic terrorism and the school shooters of recent years uh, into one terror. And you just, you know, you just feel like you should just throw an Ebola and, and you just have our ultimate, you know, modern nightmare right there. To the crazy martini now, Jim, and we've mentioned uh, in the past that the president is waiting on uh, the midterm elections to be passed to unveil his unilateral and some would say unconstitutional uh, approach to immigration policy reform. Now, even more black eyes for the administration when it comes to how they've already been dealing with this issue. Courtesy of USA Today, new records contradict the Obama administration's assurances to Congress and the public that the 2,200 people had freed from immigration jails last year to save money had only minor criminal records. The records obtained by USA Today show immigration officials released some undocumented immigrants who had faced far more serious criminal charges, including people charged with kidnapping, sexual assault, drug trafficking, and homicide, even though ICE had released a statement saying that it only had released low-risk offenders who do not have serious criminal records. And then when caught on it, they said, well, that was just uh, budgetary reasons, and we didn't really have any control over those people getting released. So, uh, Jim, once again, the reality not matching the rhetoric whatsoever. Well, it's not just that. I mean, like, this is the administration lying. First, they claim that, you know, because of sequestration, the only thing they could do is let all these people out of jail, uh, as if there was nothing else in the federal government that could be cut. There was nothing less, uh, you know, no other area they could put off spending money. And then once they do this and people are, are justifiably screaming bloody murder over this, they say, oh, it was only a few hundred people. And then they later back say, well, when we, by a few hundred, we meant 2,300. Theoretically, technically, it's a group of hundreds, <laughs> 23 of them. Um, and then, you know, this, they say, well, it's only minor infractions. Well, actually, no, it's not. And, and this is why, as I mentioned in the jolt today, I'm kind of, you know, infuriated by the comprehensive immigration reform crowd who just refuses to acknowledge these sorts of things mm -hmm. and to observe that, look, you can't reach a deal with this, this administration because they lie all the time. You know, there, there can't be something where we'll make a concession and you guys make a concession later because that concession is never going to come. Um, and these people will lie to your face about it. And they will lie about life and death issues. I'd love to know what the, uh, what the homicide case was and what the family of the victim thinks. Um, this administration just let them all out because they want to prove a point about immigration and stuff like that. They are irresponsible, they are incompetent, and they are dishonest. And, uh, you know, th this is hopefully this is going to fuel a, uh, an expression of righteous anger in these midterms. And I certainly hope Republicans get the right message here. There's no, there's no time to comprehensive re immigration reform deal in the, in the lame duck session. And there's not going to be anything with this administration because you can't trust them. And I think the idea that any, any Republican would trust Obama immigration, but that might be our craziest martini in, in quite some time, Greg. <laughs> it could be. You'd think the, uh, the president with the most high-tech campaign ever would realize that other people have the Internet and can actually check <laughs> some of the things they're saying here. But every time they, they throw a lie out there, they get called on it. They, they would have been fantastic a generation ago. <laughs> <laughs> 
We were born too early, Greg. That's what they're, or, you know, somebody Obama's lamenting to Biden. We were born too early, you know. <laughs> Uh, on that very sobering note, uh, Jim, good to talk to you today. We'll talk to you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Columbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today, and be sure to join us again on Friday for the next Three Martini Lunch.